Hey, Mike from Prep Pros, and today we're going to talk about the second harder math module on the digital SAT. This has been the greatest challenge for most students on test day, and this also has produced one of the most commonly asked questions among students is, how should I prepare for the second harder math module? Because most students really feel like there's not adequate resources out there that are reflective of what they're seeing on test day. So we're gonna talk about what I've been doing to prepare students for the second harder math module and I've had quite a bit of success with students getting perfect scores and a ton of students scoring in the high 700s. We're gonna talk about why this has been such a big challenge for many students and what my recommendations for you would be so you make sure you're ready for it on test day. But before we get to all of that at the end of the video, we're gonna take a look at a few of the varieties of questions that have been showing up on that second harder math module and teach you some really important strategies along the way. All right, so here we see in the given function g of 4 equals 5, g of 7 equals 135, what is the value of g of 9? Now, strategically, when we see a question like this, the first thing I think about is number one, we're given x and y values or g of x values. So we're probably going to want to plug those in. And also, we have multiple variables here. So this is probably in some way going to be a game of substitution for us to work through. So see if you can figure this out on your own. But I'm going to start walking through this here. So first thing I'm going to do, is simply substitute in those values. So we'll have 135 equals AB to the seven over N. We're also gonna have five equals AB to the four over N. Now, next thing that I can do here to make my life as easy as possible is, well, if I divide these two expressions by each other, 135 divided by five is gonna give us 27. This is really like a to the first and a to the first, so we're gonna cancel out those a's. So this is gonna give us that 27 equals b to the three over n. So we would love to know what b to the one over n is, so we can ultimately go back through and substitute in at the end in some way. So what I can see is if we know this is b to the three over n, we can essentially just take this entire expression and raise it to the one third power or the cube root, and that's gonna give us that three is equal to b to the one over n. So now we know a nice piece of this expression here. So now from here, what we can kind of do is we can use, let's just use this expression here. We can use either one and we're gonna start substituting back in. So what we know is b to the one over n is equal to three. So we can take that second expression again, we would have five equals a b to the four over n. Well, what we know is b to the one over n is equal to three. So we could rewrite this as five equals a times three to the fourth one over n is also we could go through and express this to make sure this makes sense for everybody. We could write this as the same as b to the one over n to the fourth power and the b to the one over n, I'm substituting in the three, therefore five is equal to a times three to the fourth. Well, three to the fourth is 81. So we can write this as five over 81 is equal to a. Now we also know that three is equal to b to the one over n. So now we can really make a lot of progress. So we're looking for g of nine. Well, g of nine here, try to keep this all on the same screen here, g of nine would be equal to a b to the nine over n. Once again, this would be the same, hopefully so this is as easy as possible to follow, this would be the same as a b to the one over n to the ninth power, and now we can substitute in. We know a equals five over 81. We know that three equals b to the one over n. So we can rewrite this as g of nine is equal to five over 81 times three to the ninth. If we wanna do this without a calculator, at this point I would just punch it in, but this will be g of nine equals five over three to the fourth times three to the ninth. We can cancel these out. This will give us that g of nine is equal to five times three to the fifth. And from there, I think that should give us 1215, but I'm gonna go ahead and punch this into my calculator. And that will give us our correct answer here of g of nine equals 1215. Really challenging question, but once again, if we strategically understand how we should be working about it, we have a fighting chance of getting this correct on test day. In the given expression, b and q are positive constants. If pq to the 11th plus r is a factor of the expression where pq and r are positive constants, what is the greatest possible value of b? 
this looks borderline impossible to solve as it's currently presented. We've got all these Qs, Q to the 11th, Q to the 22nd, it looks really overwhelming. But there's one step we can take to make this a lot more friendly for us to work through. We could go ahead and we could say Q to the 11th is equal to X. So we can rewrite this whole expression as 34 X squared because Q to the 11th to the second is equal to Q to the 22nd. So there's the same as if X equals Q to the 11th, we can write this as X squared plus BX plus 60 here. Now I'm going to just make this a capital B because I know otherwise my B's and 6's can look a little bit similar. And now we're trying to maximize B. Well, this is kind of a factoring question, but it's really conceptual as well. If we want to create the biggest possible B, what we kind of know here is we're going to have values that have to multiply to 60, and we're going to have values that have to multiply to 34 for our leading term. Now the way we can maximize this is by picking our biggest leading term and having it in the opposite factor from the greatest possible value we could get for our final term. So this means we'd want to have 34x plus 1 and x plus 60. This is going to maximize the b value because the greatest value we're going to create is going to be made by the 34 times the 60, and then we're just going to be adding one additional x to get us to b. So as we go through, and then we'll talk about one other situation, and hopefully this will really click, if we go through and we do 34 times 60, this is going to end up, we'll just FOIL all the way through, we'll get 34x squared plus 2040x plus x plus 60. So this will give us 34x squared plus 2041x plus 60. So our greatest possible b value is going to be 2041. Now, I know this kind of final step we took here is a bit conceptual. So we're going to kind of go back and go through another situation. Hopefully this will make more sense. So let's say we went through and we're just going to still leave that 34 in here to not make life too crazy. But let's say, well, we can also get to 60 by doing two times three. So let's say we did 34 X plus two and X plus 30. Well, in this instance here, our B term, we're going to end up with 34 X squared plus 1020 X plus two X plus 60. Well, that's going to be nowhere near as large as the 2041 X that we created in our prior one. That's why we always have to, if you get this, you're maximizing B, you want to leave your leading term as great as possible, and you want that final term to also be as great as possible. And that's going to help you find the biggest possible B value by doing exactly what we did before, which is going to be using these as your factors, and that will lead you to the correct answer. Now we're going to take a look at an example from our math book. And what I think really, one of the reasons I think my math book is by far the best resource out there for the digital SAT on top of being far more up to date than pretty much anything else out there. But we also have a leveling system that lets you know exactly how challenging which question is. So depending on your math level, you can jump through the chapters and do the questions that are going to have the greatest impact on your score. And these level four questions are most challenging questions. There's hundreds of them. And they really do a fantastic job of preparing you for that second harder math module. And I had quite a few emails from students after the test that they got this question, something very similar to it on their test, and they knew exactly what to do. So they were able to get this question right that stumped pretty much all of their friends. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can work through and solve it. And then we'll break down the correct strategy in a second. So here, since we know x plus 3a is a factor, well, if we're solving for x when we know x plus 3a is a factor, we always set it equal to zero, so that means x is equal to negative 3a. So what this now tells us is we can start plugging in negative 3a for x in each of these equations. Only one of them, when we solve through, is going to give us a as a positive integer, and that's going to be our correct answer. So that's what strategically we're looking for here. So we're just going to jump to our correct answer here so we don't spend too much time, but we're simply going to plug in negative 3a for x. So we'll do 3 times negative 3a to the second, plus 24 times negative 3a plus 18a and we'll set this all equal to zero. So as we go through this is going to give us 3 times negative 3a squared which is going to give us 9a squared so this will leave us with 27a squared minus 72a plus 18a is equal to zero. So now we can simplify further 27a squared 
this is now going to be minus 54a is equal to 0. Well, we can now start to factor this down and simplify. We can take a 27a out of each of these terms. So we can do 27a times a minus 2 is equal to 0. That will give us solutions of 27a equals 0. So that will give us that a is equal to 0. That's not a positive integer. But when we have a minus 2 is equal to 0, well, that will give us that a equals 2. There's our positive integer. That's how we can see that d is our correct answer. No other answer choice when we go through similar steps is going to give us a positive integer. That's what you're looking for when you see a question like this on test day. Now, as you can see, after working through those few questions, you really need to know the exact strategy or method to find the correct answer, or they're borderline impossible for you to work through. And that's generally speaking the theme for all of the questions you're going to see from about 15 to 22 in that second harder module. You need to know how to solve them or they're going to be really hard for you to figure out on your own, even if you're a very strong math student. And this is why the second harder math module has been such a challenge for so many students, because there's very few resources that actually accurately reflect what you're seeing on test day. Khan Academy, the College Board Question Bank are great resources, but they're not reflective of the types of questions that you're seeing. And if you aren't exposed to these, it's really hard to figure these out on the fly on test day. So the reason that I've had so much success with so many of my students is, number one, our math book is more up to date and more comprehensive than anything else out there. And it also features that really unique leveling system that lets you know the exact questions that you should be doing so you can do really well in the second harder math module. And the other piece that's been super important and helpful for students is the advanced math course. This features 150 expert level questions that are really reflective of what you're gonna see on test day. A huge benefit for me working with so many students and having so many students in my courses is I get a lot of direct feedback of exactly what's happening on test day. And I'm constantly updating these materials so that they're really reflective of what you're gonna see. Now we're gonna talk about my recommendations. In the description below, I'm gonna go through all of this stuff in a lot more detail, but we're really gonna hit the bullet points here in the video. So the first thing that I've been doing both with one-on-one -on -one students and students in my courses when they're getting stuck in the second harder math module is have them work through all the level three and level four questions in my book. So make sure you pick up a copy of that. Now, the second thing is sign up for the ultimate digital SAT math course. This is going to feature in-depth video explanations to all 1500 questions in the book, along with lessons and a lot of alternative Desmos ways you can solve those questions. Learning how to solve the questions in the most efficient and effective manner possible is really, really important to your success on test day. And the third thing we're going to have you do when we get to those final week and a half or two weeks before your SAT is work through that advanced math course. This is really going to prime you for test day. Make sure you've retained everything you've learned so far and make sure you're familiar with all these different types of varieties that you can see. So you're really armed with knowing exactly how you should be approaching almost every single question that you're going to see on your test. Now, if you guys have any questions around anything in this video at all, or any questions around SAT math, drop them in the comments below. If you guys want to see in-depth explanations to some of those questions that I popped on the screen, you can check those out both in the free trial for my Ultimate Digital SAT Math course and my Ultimate SAT course.